Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, I'm Rick Harnish. I'm the executive director of the High Speed Rail Alliance. Uh, we are an educational nonprofit working for uh, fast, frequent, and dependable trains across the entire country. Uh, we're member supported. So for those of you who, have, uh, who are members, thank you very much. For those of you who aren't, um, if you like this program, please join us at uh, our website, hsrail.org, um, after the event. So uh, we're educated and we're focused on education. Uh, we strive to be the most knowledgeable independent source of information about high speed rail, um, what it is, why we should build it here in the States, and what we can do, uh, what local leaders and uh, state and federal leaders can do to make it happen. Uh, we don't see high speed rail as a standalone system. We see it as part of a network where different pieces are working together in different ways. In some cases, the trains go on different types of infrastructure in a single journey. In some cases, passengers are making easy connections between stations um, as they go along. Uh, but the piece that brings the volume and makes the whole system work is the segments uh, typically built around the world in, in uh, uh, 100 to 200 mile segments of true high speed rail where the trains can go really fast and really frequently, but they all feed into each other to make a big network. Uh, so we've got a combined presentation today. Um, we've got uh, fog tech fire protection uh, to talk about, uh, you know, what can be done to, to keep fires at a minimum on trains, which is very important. And then uh, we've, uh, we'll talk about how monorails can be a key link in this big picture system that we're talking about um, as we move forward. Um, I started the day talking uh, uh, with some folks in California about a critical vote that's coming up uh, there. Uh, so uh, we won't talk about that much today, but, but look for more communications about some critical things we need to do about California in the next month or so. Um, so uh, thank you all again for being here and thank you to our speakers. Um, and Roger, I will let you take it from here. Thank you so much, Rick. Thank you very much for introduction, for your opening words. Um, I hope that it works to share the screen. Should be. Can you see that? Does yes, it work? Absolutely. Okay. Excellent. So thank you very much for everybody out there uh, during this hard times where we look more and more to to cameras and computers instead of meeting personally, which makes us mostly I think ill as we like to meet people. But um, coming to our presentation, we do today a joint uh, presentation because within my position as a managing director of Poctech Fire Protection for Rail Systems in, in Germany and my activity as a vice president of the International Monorail Association, we thought, especially based on the topic which Rick already mentioned, the network which we need to become uh, to get our future mobility as an intermodal concept in general to combine public transportation, high speed and all the other things around. We thought that it would be a good point to bring up also the activities of the International Monorail Association and to explain a little bit more about what move forward there because a lot of people have monorails still in mind for amusement parks or have a very old picture of them but it's quite modern and innovative technology already uh, now so but we will start with the foctech fire protection um, topics uh, to explain shortly what's going on how these things are going on in especially in us and north america and for this i have with me uh, jonathan redding uh, our area sales manager for the rail systems um, applications and also an FPA 130 supporter for the fire protection standards. 
And on the other side, um, with me, with us is Marco Krönke, uh, Managing Director, CEO of IM Rail Technology in Germany, as well as the President-elect of the International Monorail Association. So good evening here from here in Germany. Good day to you in the US. And let's start. The agenda, um, roughly, I will present FOCTEC fire protection in a, shot a nutshell uh, very shortly. We'll bring up two main topics, which I think would help also you in understanding that fire protection is not always a bad thing. Uh, giving additional weight, give additional maintenance also can give a lot of benefits and not speaking also because, uh, on making people afraid of fire, making things as a, in a holistic approach even much more better in financial topics and uh, for the whole safety concept. Jonathan will explain a bit more about FOCTEC in North America, and then we'll switch over to Marco Krönke, who, uh, as I said, uh, the president-elect of the International Monorail Association, to bring you closer monorail as a real solution of public to, uh, for public transportation, and maybe a first step to change also the mind of some people which, which have not so positive image right now about monorails. And at the end, of course, there would be some room for the discussion. Coming first to the FOCTEC fire protection, I will make this quite quick at the entrance. Uh, FOCTEC was founded in 1997, is located in Cologne in Germany, is working with a lot of local partners in the different countries. Uh, it's more a team of experts in engineering and design for complex firefighting and fire detection systems means not looking in mass solutions for hotels, for, for buildings like a sprinkler, in the sprinkler industry. It's more related to special solutions in niche markets. Uh, FOCTEC is coming from the field of high pressure water mist technology, spraying water in very, very small droplets to make it most efficient in use. And for this reason, mostly used in areas when normal systems comes to their limit special applications where special requirements are given. And for this reason, the experts here are more on the engineering side um, and to find the customer's um, most needed solution. Within the 20, uh, more than 20 years, FogTech now became in its markets one of the leading companies worldwide. And very active here um, around the globe, 80% of our business is in export. Uh, still, US, Canada is here in gray, but this will change within this year because also now the movement is started to become more local in US with an own site. Looking to the main business units, we speak about um, building and industrial applications, rolling stock applications and underground infrastructures like tunnels. And today we are focusing on the rolling stock applications where FogTech is world leading supplier for active fire protection solutions. FOCTEC, what we are, we are a system provider for active fire protection solutions, means fire detection and fire suppression and rolling stock applications, a system integrator with full system verification programs, and with a wide product portfolio for different levels of technology and safety, means from the very simple smoke detector for the toilet cell up to a complete ZEAL-2 certified system to cover passenger areas, traction equipment, and all the different other areas on a train. We have a full-time rolling stock team. I think this is one of the most important points uh, compared to, the, to other fire protection companies because the people here really work on rolling stock, are coming from the rolling stock industry, and really have a soul for rolling stock applications and not doing one day an archive, one day a uh, hotel and so on. Uh, FogTech delivered up to today uh, more than 17,500 systems to the market worldwide, which are already in operation there. And still very, this is very good, <laughs> still growing very good. If we speak about uh, the product portfolio, we speak about fire detection systems on different technical levels from very simple solution up to high, uh, con um, high complex to safety systems with different kinds of data communications, all the things around to get integrated to the train. And after the fire detection, the fire fighting solutions with different technical solutions like water mist, aerosols, 
uh, gas systems, and this all up to a ZL2 certification. Uh, integrated into the train uh, looks a little bit like this. This is just to give an idea. You see some of the references down there. And of course, based on the forum where we are today, I put directly on the left side at first some of our high-speed trains, which we protected here for the European market in this case, so with Alstom and Stadler. Uh, but you see also other applications like metros, double-deck trains, regional trains, locomotives, light rail vehicles. And you will see later on also from Jonathan, which are protected in the US and North, uh, Canadian market up to now. Just to give an impression, how does it look like? I hope the videos will run now to give you an idea how water mist looks like on the trains. If we speak about a passenger area. And um, as you can see within this 10 to 15 seconds video, the room is filling up with this kind of water mist, which I was speaking about where Foctic is coming from, specially developed here for the railway applications with very low amount of water. Each of these nozzles, we speak about two liters per minute, means for such a metro train like we see here in the city of Essen in Germany, uh, this train is carrying 60 liters of water to protect the passenger area in case of fire. The aim in such cases is not to extinguish the fire immediately, it's to get the situation under control, to allow the people to stay on board until the train is arriving on the next evacuation place and to, uh, to give the opportunity for the people to escape without any risk from the fire. But this means also if the, the fire situation is covered in this way, of course the fire scenario for the train is changing and for, for this, I will come back with another slide later on. To give an ad, another idea from the generator room, um, in this case, it's a generator car for the Israel State Railway, uh, manufactured by Bombardier. You see a completely different density of water mist because the fire scenario is completely different. As in this case, we speak about fires with oil, fuel, and similar li liquid, fl flammable liquids. Uh, the heat release curve would be completely different. And so for this reason, the amount of water in the first moment must be higher, but shorter in time to bring out. And same way diesel power packs for underflow applications. Uh, here we have a video for the diesel unit, which is now under the floor. During driving with 120 kilometers per hour, we put a glass on the openings for the maintenance and activated the system during driving. You see how the train is shaking. And from the video, you also can see uh, that we do this not only since today, it's a video from 2004 from uh, older projects. This is done on this kind of systems installed on several hundreds of so-called Regio shuttles. It's a regional train driven with a diesel power pack and uh, protected with such a Foctec system. Uh, beside water mist, I already mentioned that we are using also gas and aerosol systems. Here is an example for a traction converter, which is mounted under floor. And you see now on the right above corner that the aerosol generator is, is activated. And you see how this aerosol is filling this room. Also here we put in glasses and the covers to monitor that uh, during the validation procedure. In this case, we are working together with an American company uh, for these solutions, and we're taking care about the railway business here for them. No, why it was, ah, okay. Uh, FOCTEC is also very active on all the standard committees in this field. So for the European area, for the CEN, uh, we are working in the fire protection groups for the uh, rolling stock that in this case is myself as a member. Uh, we are very active in the Italian market because Italy has a very special own like an island solution where all trains which are going to, through a tunnel longer than one kilometer has to be protected with a water mist system in the passenger area. 
and uh, this is given by law and also existing rolling stock has to be equipped have to be equipped until end of 2023 now if i'm right um, so it means also trains which are already approved have to be refurbished and to get such a system and then we are very active also with the as a, a committee one nfpa committee 130 where we are a guest attendee and a supporter for the internal working groups, which Jonathan is taking care about. I would like to mention also two uh, research projects where Poptech has a quite active role in. One is Sovereign. Sovereign is taking care, and we will see one slide especially on that, uh, for so-called new energy carriers. New energy, energy carriers means everything about hydrogen, battery-driven vehicles, Mainly it was coming from the road industry, this project from the ministry, uh, because it's supported by the German government. But step by step, the working packages changed also to the battery driven uh, e-bikes and, and things like that. And for this, we come to a point called e-bikes on trains. Uh, and then on the other side, there's a tunnel uh, underground uh, research pro project, solid safety of life in tunnels where also huge fire protect, uh, fire tests were done. About the certifications, uh, Foctec is a certified welding company um, and for rolling stock equipment. And on the other side, I think one of the most important quality certifications, the IRIS and ISO standards are also with Foctec. Some of our OEM customers, I already mentioned 17,500 systems in operation worldwide. And some of them you can see here uh, where we are supplying to. Then two slides uh, where I want to mention some special points. Uh, these curves where you see the heat release rate on the Y axle and the time on the X axle uh, is showing fire scenarios, how fires are developing. And we see from different cities in Germany, Dortmund, Wien, Essen, and then for Deutsche Bahn, the operator in Germany also, they all have different curves. And the city of Essen did a real scale uh, test. They really burned one of these old, older trains to see uh, how the fire scenario is on their train. And they got this black curve and they had a lot of problems during this time then to get the, uh, it approved um, in regard to the evacuation times, escape routes in the underground stations in the city center because they are partly quite old. And so they were looking for a solution um, how they can manage it without this huge investment, which you would have with bigger smoke extraction systems or with a second escape route to integrate. Um, you can imagine that the amount of investment would be so huge, which is sometimes not possible for the city government actually. So. We came to the game and we discussed this very detailed and we asked them why always fighting results of a fire so why fighting the uh, the result but not the cause uh, means if i protect the train and get this fire scenario covered and um, to ensure the surroundings um, then maybe the scenario can change and this was exactly what we could see in the video with the passenger area and here on the left you see some pictures from the fire test um, at the end, the scenario could get so good under control that the approval body in Germany decided to um, give a new fire scenario. In case a train is equipped with a FOGTEC system, you can use a green curve for heat release. And this means also for smoke development and temperature development in the underground station. Uh, to go for with the green line and for the city of Essen in this case because they did an economical study about that it means that they could save 89% of the investment by equipping the trains instead of refurbishing all the underground stations. The other point the research project Sovereign you see also the link here we can provide of course also later on uh, which is taking care about new energy carriers. Um, the work, working packages also covering the railway industry with hydrogen and battery driven trains looking into the fire scenarios try to reproduce fire uh, reproduce uh, reproducible fire scenarios uh, to make scenarios in this way handleable 
that the people okay, know how to manage the depot, the underground stations and so on. Because as you know by yourself, it's a completely different scenario if this kind of trains would start with a fire instead of having a fuel or diesel uh, driven train or an electric fire uh, from the catenary. So the targets here is the definition of scenarios to close the gap in knowledge because everybody wants to become greener with such technologies but is not taking care always about the risks. And I don't want to make, make people afraid about the risks. It's only a question how to control the risk. And for this reason, also this project is taking care about the validation of risk control measures like fire detection, fire protection, fire fighting system. And just uh, when Rick and I had a, uh, one of our calls, um, I was in the, in the, uh, in the Institute of fire for Applied Fire Science, IFAP, and they did just during this day some e-bike fire tests. And I just would like to give a short overview from a video from them you see here a mock-up simulating a fire scenario which is normally used to um, to approve firefighting systems in passenger areas and they uh, did a provocation on the accumulator to the battery to start to burn and it was very impressive to see how fast the fire is developing after the first cell is uh, starting uh, so when the thermal runaway is starting uh, to go through and um, how big the fire is becoming with the equipment you have there in the surroundings. Uh, there, later on, they did also comparison tests with uh, activation of water mist systems and other technologies to see how good such fires can be controlled and how effective it would work. This, I think, we will have a report about in approximately one month. And if this would be a topic, of course, there would be also a possibility to support you with with all what you need. Uh, there will be also some seminars, uh, some webinars uh, for FOCTEC on this special uh, new energy carrier topics. And this is a point where I would like to give over to Jonathan. And uh, Jonathan will explain just something about the American market for us. And Jonathan, just let me know when I so should switch uh, further. Okay, thank you very much, Roger. Um, FogTech has been um, providing fire protection systems for rolling stock in the United in North America for over 10 years now. Uh, we are active members of APTA and also work together with them um, on the committees as a guest of the NFPA to give our contribution to developing the standard with our, our knowledge. I'd just like to give you some ideas of some of the uh, applications or some of the vehicles which we've equipped in the United States. Would you like to move on, Roger? This, um, the locomotives the, um, in New Jersey, the Alp 45 from uh, Bombardier, are dual traction. They are equipped with uh, diesel electric and electric um, power. And for, because of the electric, for the diesel engines, uh, they have a detection system and we provided uh, a water mist suppression uh, system. So this detects in all the electrical equipment, the smoke and in the uh, diesel, the, any fire will be detected by heat. And we have uh, a very effective water mist suppression system, which uh, uh, will su suppress the fire and control the heat as well. The same type of vehicle is used in Montreal by AMT. Um, also, um, the main reason for the uh, uh, enhanced uh, fire si protection system is because of the, the tunnel running in both the New Jersey underneath the, uh, the Hudson and uh, in, uh, in Montreal. So we have some newer um, projects. Uh, the Los Angeles Metro are extending um, the, uh, the, the red and purple line and uh, a new fleet of the, uh, the HR 4000 uh, Metro vehicles. These are the very first newly built or new build Metro vehicles in uh, the United States to be equipped with not only a smoke detection system in the passenger areas, but with a water mist suppression. Uh, from FogTech. Uh, these will 
be going into service in a, in, a, in a year on or a couple of years. In Canada, we equipped the Toronto rocket or one of the Toronto rocket trains as a, as a pilot installation uh, to show or to give a demonstration that these vehicles um, could be equipped with also a detection system in the, air, in the passenger area and the water mist suppression. Uh, this was to um, give them a, uh, an improved safety analysis uh, for the vehicles running in tunnels. On to the next slide, please. Now, Stadler have, um, with their uh, work in Salt Lake City, uh, uh, they're providing quite a few new trains in the United States. Uh, Texrail uh, was one of the first uh, to use the uh, regional or commuter train, uh, the Flirt 3. And these are, um, these have a diesel power pack, so they'll be a diesel engine compartment. And uh, to protect this, we uh, have supplied, supplied also heat detection and using not water mist, but an aerosol uh, agent to, uh, in this compartment. These trains are all similar. They'll be in San Bernardino the, uh, and also in the Dallas Adart. Uh, we'll also be using uh, these types of, of trains. Let's move on to the next slide. In Philadelphia, the, um, the new double deck uh, commuter trains uh, will be using um, a detection system from FogTech. Detection is one of the most important parts of of which of any uh, protection system being able to detect a fire quickly and be able to then react to it or alert, alert passengers or emergency services or even in fact the driver is very important. In uh, Ottawa, the Stadler have also providing the, the Flirt 3 also with a similar system to in, in, in Dallas, uh, San Bernardino and uh, Texrail. And we have another um, two other trains, which are a bit more uh, slightly different. The um, um, well, it's Manitou and Peak uh, and Pike Peak Railway. This is um, a uh, um, cog and uh, railway. I've shown a picture of the of the older trains, not the new ones that are being provided by Stadler. The older trains, obviously, are in a nice, very nice setting here. Uh, and these will also have um, in the uh, smoke and temperature detection for detecting fires in the various areas. Also another uh, mountainous um, area, the Rocky Mountaineer, also um, providing uh, these double deck panorama vehicles, uh, also using um, detection and, uh, and firefighting in the electrical areas uh, cabinets. Uh, with the aerosol agent. I'll just give an idea of, of some of the applications. As Roger mentioned, also um, we work or we attend the uh, the NFPA 130, uh, which is the, uh, uh, the committee meetings to give our, our contribution. The in the current edition of the um, NFPA 130, there are a couple some sections which refer to. Uh, systems such as uh, vehicles with open gangways, where it says the design shall include a fe features to deter both smoke and fire spread from car to car. This was typically done with fire doors, but um, uh, there are obviously possibilities by having a fire suppression system on board um, to obviously stop that fire from developing uh, at all, uh, which is also can be considered a way of compensating for those fire doors uh, to stop the, that fire from developing and then reducing any fire spread. The NFPA does in fact mention that the fact that fire suppression systems can be used, can be used to limit the fire growth, uh, which is very similar to what um, Roger showed with the uh, exhibit, uh, the example from, from Essen, where the fire growth is limited. So you have a totally different um, development curve um, and because of the flexibility of the NFPA, uh, it, it would say this could be used. 
based on supported by engineering analysis, which is sometimes done by, by testing, uh, as we've, we've shown. In the next edition of the NFPA 130, uh, there has been, or have proposed uh, in the public input to uh, in the, add to the annex more information about the advantages and use uh, and application of fire detection, as well as fire suppression on the vehicles. And the Open Gangway Working Group um, is also uh, very much involved in uh, providing information about um, how this requirement in the NFPA um, can be addressed in, in, in more than one way, not just with, with fire doors. So that was my part about, thank you very much. So then, uh, thank you very much, Jonathan. Uh, this was our part. And now we'll give it over to Marco for the International Memorial Association. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm actually living in both worlds in Canada and Ontario and as well in Germany with uh, some of the companies. So I'm talking today about the International Monorail Association and a little bit about monorails where I was just coming the other day yesterday and the day before from the APTA high speed rail conference and there was so much enthusiasm and motivation about the high speeds rails across in the US. But as well, there were some of the topics, actually, how do we bring the people towards the stations? How do we do the integration of the different modes of, of railways? So there was a lot of topics about mass transits, both in the city, uh, but as well for commuter. And I want to talk today a little bit about the monorails. If you please can go to the next slide. Our association is uh, around 10 years old. So we going and we are doing the promotion um, of monorails. Probably, as Roger told, everybody immediately recognized the, the Disney monorail and associates with it. But it is really a mass transit system. If you see the total system, um, it has a special niche in the market. If you look at the total systems when comparing different technologies. So we can carry the same capacity as standard metro systems can carry on a much lower cost level. Uh, because we go on an elevated system on really small infrastructure print footprint, which then leads to much lower cost. This is not so much known. And uh, our association is promoting exactly this total system of the monorails by providing a lot of publication, uh, yearly conferences, Currently, we are performing um, a standard, which we call a performance-based specification, both for clients of the cities, but as well for consultants, um, for OEMs, and anybody who is interested in learning, actually, about the monorail systems. Um, we have, as well, a lot of media, and we are uh, convening as well on other conferencing uh, presentations, connecting people, people both from the industry, uh, from the politicians, from the clients, from universities. If you may want to go to the next slide where we have our yearly conferences, typically always at the Innotrans in Berlin, but as well all other year in a different city around the globe. Uh, so you can see some pictures where we were having a conference in Berlin, one in Cologne. It's actually in front of the Foctec building there. On the lower left side, you can see the so-called H-Bahn, H-Rail in Düsseldorf. Um, the other year, we had been in Chiba in Japan. Japan is actually the country for monorails, started in, in the 50s but really established the first longer lines in the 60s. 
still running and still increasing as normal as metro trains. And you can see as well Las Vegas in 2015 having our yearly conference. The next slide I want to discuss a little bit about the generic market trends where we have urbanization and congestion, automation and digital solutions, comfort, environmental awareness, value for money, safety and cybersecurity. So these are the generic trends which we perfectly can match with the monorail system as we understand our system as a total turnkey system addressing these kind of needs in a smart way. On the next page, we can see how it mainly has the advantages over other system. It's not the solution for every needs, but in a lot of cases it, it makes sense because it can have inherent advantages. So it's a mainly elevated track. And as you already can see on the right upper picture, where you can see the shade of the track, it's much less than a big slab metro. And if I compare just the concrete that is used uh, for, a, let's say, 30 meter monorail track, um, having all the ingredients there totaling of up to 150 tons, the same line as a metro would use 450 tons. So you can see the massive impact um, compared monorails with the metro system. So for lower infrastructure, great separation. Um, we have um, always the advantage over when running in tunnels. We have flexible alignment. We have the lowest land use. And I think this is a key advantage here. Typically, we talk about automated train operations, so fully automated and driverless, uh, which enables short and as well, which is even more important, reliable travel times, because we talk always about a total systems that is fully integrated. So what we are having is uh, either at airports or at big stations, have a constant and having an on-demand system a flow of capacity from stations towards their destinations then. The next slide is showing then as well a comparison on the line capacity over the operating speed. So you can see on the right side the metros with higher capacities, typically between 30,000 and up to 100,000, then the light metros and the next lower one is the monorail as the typical area between, let's say, 3,000 and 25,000 people per hour per direction. So it is a mass transit solution. Um, higher capacities than LRVs, trams, or best bus rapid transit systems. On the next slide, the same graph, but compared to capital costs. So the lower, obviously, the lower the initial capital cost. And you can see, compared to metro system, um, there's a significant difference. Typically, double of the cost is, is a metro system. For sure, um, we are, on the monorail side, more costly than trams because they typically go at grade level. Um, but the great separation on elevated tracks and the safety on separate lines are inherent. On the next page, we can see some of the summaries. So the idle capacity, 5,000 to 25,000 people per hour per direction. Uh, but there exists as well high capacity monorail as the one in Sao Paulo. So it's a uh, on the line 15, a seven car train with already 48,000 people per hour per direction. So it's quite a massive system used every day by 50,000 people um, running as the elevated system around 12 to 50 meters above ground. So there are even crossings on bridges below the monorail system. Then, on the next page, we have 
the Slender Guideway renderings and pictures. Um, on the below one, which I really like, is going through living buildings. So it's not only like in, in Las Vegas resorts, hotels, um, but it's as well in urban areas because we run on rubber tired systems. So there is no noise emission at all. It's quiet and really unique that there's not a problem at all to run build, through buildings. On the next page, we have um, the footprint. So we have minimized infrastructure costs. And as you may know, the infrastructure cost counts more than half of the total costs. And we have optimized the monorail turnkey systems on the infrastructure. This is why we can outmatch other prices or other costs of different technologies. On the next page, we have the alignment cap capabilities. So typically Metro systems goes down to 100 meter curve radius, but the monorails at least can have 50 meters, which is extremely important if you have already, let's say mega cities, uh, dense area, where you still need to provide more mobility solution. Um, it's difficult to steal the streets for trams because typically they are crowded with other traffic and that you don't want to take away. Metros, as already explained, are pretty expensive for sure. That's a definitely nice solution. But usually if you don't have any other means, you want to go elevated around buildings, and use least uh, space, the monorail is a perfect solution for a dense and close areas. On the next page, we have again the monorail running through an, an, a hotel area in, in Las Vegas. Uh, so you have a lot of examples as well in, in similar system of the people mover in Singapore going really close by outside windows. On the next picture, we have examples of the guide beams. So it's a fast um, project um, progress here where we have pre-installed tracks that can be um, installed overnight or on the weekend. So everything, for example, can be built in front of the city and bring in uh, during the night because they are light and fast to install. The overall project costs are as well much lower than traditional uh, metro systems. On the next page, uh, we have as well the futuristic and locally influenced look. So we can see a suspended monorail on the left-hand side in, in China. Um, and as well, again, on the right-hand side, the Las Vegas, um, monorail, which you may have uh, seen or ride on already. The next page, we have then a little bit of technical graphical visualization. Um, you see the rubber tires. Um, most of the system are derived from the German Alvec system, where you see a dual rubber tire system mounted on a bogey, having more rubber tires for guiding and holding the train on the track. So they are, th this is like the guiding and uh, loading system, as well as similar system upside down. If you look at the middle lower picture of the suspended monorail, they run as well on rubber tires, um, just being suspended. There are some advantages, some disadvantages compared of both systems, um, both run this is, you can see on the right side, the Wuppertaler Schwebebahn, more than 100 years in service operation, both the initial system, but as well a recently redesigned system. So they are serious mass transit system already of more than 50 system around the globe, um, which are taken every day. On the next page, we have some current projects. Um, so China is uh, extremely um, 
emerging market, uh, which have done a lot of recent uh, monorails, uh, existing ones from uh, licensing uh, Hitachi system. In the middle, you can see the already mentioned Sao Paulo line um, that are 378 vehicles on a 24 kilometers length of alignment. Currently, um, this year in service operation to bring the Bangkok in Thailand monorail system by now Alstom that procured the Bombardier side of transportation. But as well, some newcomers on the lower left side, uh, BYD from China. Um, they are just in the phase on Sao Paulo Line 17. In the middle, a really nice project about the Panama can uh, Canal from Hitachi. And as well, a long system, two lines, each more than 30 kilometers in Cairo for the new capital uh, system there. On the next page, um, the conclusion. So some of the inherent advantages of the track that they are on dedicated right of way with unrestricted operation on elevated tracks by using the lowest land usage. Uh, we just have small track pillars. Um, we don't need a lot of infrastructure, have small curve radius and steep grade capabilities with the lowest shadow impact on small track beams and the shortest installation phase. So the vehicle performed the highest safety standards by fully automated and driverless operation. That leads again to short waiting times and short headways. Uh, we have low efficiency because we run fully electrical propulsion and recuperation. And because of the rubber ties, we don't have any no noise emission. So thank you so much. And I guess we have uh, some time then for discussion on either of the topics for FogTech and for sure as well for the monorail. Thank you so much. Thank you guys for uh, an excellent presentation. I really appreciate that. And um, I guess my first question out of the box is if the next, um, Convention is in Milan. Is that because Milan is considering building one? Good question. Thanks a lot. It's actually a hybrid conference, both digital. Last year we had a digital conference around the clock, around the globe there. And this time we are hoping to have the hybrid solution. So we have already a book a system in Italy, both in Milan, we have friends from the university and we are visiting a people mover system in Bologna. So we always make both a technical tour, uh, looking at the depot, the operation system and the vehicle, how it's running and performing and having some university educational aspects of uh, the system then where we have conferences, white paper presentations and some speeches then. Uh, uh. I'm sorry, I, I lost my thought. So I will go to the first question. Um, how do you differentiate between a true fire and a passenger smoking a cigarette? Okay, this is then up to Foktek. Um, yeah, th there's indeed an algorithm also in the software of the systems. Uh, so not only a single smoke detection on a smoke detector will release a fire alarm or fire suppression act action. Uh, there's an algorithm behind to try to get these things covered. And we have a very good uh, experience with the so-called two, dyna two, dyna yeah, two detector dynamic system, um, where the software is checking the situation, how smoke is increasing and so on. So there's a specific uh, technology behind to avoid smoking passengers to release an alarm or system. Excellent, thank you. Um, and then we switch back topics again. So I guess we're gonna go back and forth. Um, you know, in a lot of ways, uh, uh, maglev is a monorail with a linear induction motor. Um, so what are the advantages? Like I rode the urban monorail in Nagoya and it went up, it was able to go up a really steep grade and then back down in a very controlled way. 
what are the advantages of having a rubber tire versus maglev? So the initial development of the maglev system was for higher speed because there is no resistance between the, the traction because obviously uh, there are no wheels because it's, it's um, at, um, running on uh, magnets then there. Um, so there's just a small gap there. But recently there have been some developments as well for the urban area. So there's one from uh, Bögel, Max Bögel system, transport system Max Bögel, cooperating as well with some Chinese companies. As well in uh, Korea, um, there's a system for lower speed, which is a little bit then comparable to the traditional monorails, which runs up to speeds of 80 kilometers per hour. Um, so more for urban areas. Um, typically, rubber tire system are less expensive uh, than the magnets that are used for uh, maglev technologies or the permanent magnets. Um, you don't need the power to elevate uh, the magnetic uh, field then at the end for, for the maglev uh, vehicles. So usually there is less, uh, the, the rubber tire system are more energy efficient. Um, for sure, maglev technology is uh, having less noise emission because there's just less resistance. So a really nice technology for a higher cost. Okay. Um, I've been wanting to go back to Seoul to ride, I guess there's one in the airport. And then there's one in Beijing, right? The slower maglevs. Yeah, it runs between Beijing and uh, Shanghai. Then. Okay. No. no, sorry. No, no maglev. Not maglev. Yeah, okay. no. <laughs> there's a slow speed maglev. I think it's like line, I can't remember. One of the metro lines in Beijing, right? Is a slow speed. Be, wow. I'm not sure to be honest. <laughs> Well, you know, um, one of the reasons I was interested in this topic is because we have this interesting challenge in Chicago. The railroad stations are here, and a big part of the, the real business district is over here. And you've got this challenging problem of where do you fit the tracks? Um, and uh, there was a guy you know, a pretty well-respected guy in, um, you know, our, our elites here in Chicago that proposed a, uh, what do you call that when it's on a cable? Along the river. And it would be- a, It's a cable, cable car river. then, yes. Oh, sorry? A cable car. A cable car, yeah. Yeah. It would just be along the river and just a tourist attraction because it didn't make it to the railroad stations. And then I said, well, wait a minute. What if it was a monorail instead in that, and that kind of solves the problem of how you get over these railroad tracks, over a river, down under a building, back up and around, so. Yeah, um, cable cars are perfectly for like um, mountain areas or for long distance, like in, in London over the River Thames, um, but they cannot provide this huge capacity as like monorails or other mass transit systems can do. And they cannot be as flexible in their alignment then. As well, some wind problems, so with too high wind speeds, uh, you have to slow them down or take them out of service then. Okay. Um, and then there's a, um, a guy who I respect a lot, um, that has said that uh, the Disney monorail really has, because it's in, you know, uh, what is that? Not future town, but the Tomorrowland, I'm sorry. People, it really has skewed our view of what monorails are and what they can do. You kind of began the presentation that way. Can you tell more about what would be different from what you see at Disneyland or Disney World compared to, to why it would really work in an urban setting? Yeah, so the, um, we are using the same standards and safety regulation as any mass transit system in, in big cities. 
So it's completely different uh, what the requirements and um, the um, uses from the client side in amusement parks are. So therefore we are having, you know, the same thing like fire suspicion systems, uh, like from FogTech as in other metro systems. Uh, we are having emergency cases, evacuation uh, scenarios, uh, the, the quality of the material, um, as well safety and critical level of up to four for the fully automated and driverless train system with a central operation. Um, so it's, it's a complete different world if you look at the technology, the, the development, the engineering capabilities that needs to be done for these kind of um, mass transit monorail systems on in a turnkey um, environment then. And then um, how is does the earthquake resistance compare to a typical like um, elevated rail line? Yeah, well, um, elevated helps a lot for earthquake uh, scenarios because you can uh, do your definition according the the swing of the different earthquakes um, shock waves there. Um, monorails are better than mon uh, than metro system because you have just a lighter track and then your calculation of the bearings uh, leads to better um, frequency scenarios to with any earthquake scenarios. Um, and then Clark is asking, and I had the same question because I guess in Sao Paulo, they've got two manu different manufacturers, right? So are there, it seems like they all, each manufacturer has a different standard. Is How, how does the industry get around that? Uh, that's true. Um, we have different, typically width of the beam. So the lowest one is from initially Bombardier, now Alstom, 690 millimeters. Um, BYD is having 700, then Hitachi is coming up with 800 millimeters width of the track, which sounds kind of odd. Um, on the other hand, you have uh, proprietary systems anyway, and much more on the signaling side. On the propulsion side, if you think about uh, what kind of a voltage use supply for the system. Um, so your total system is kind of proprietary in any cases where the mechanical part of the track is just a low number adding up to, you know, specialty of the system than there. But I agree, the sanitization can be better. And this is as well what we are doing within the International Monorail Association by providing the um, the performance-based specification, which is a degree of standardization or a standard. Excellent. And then one last question before we go, uh, switching back to FogTech. Um, if you've got this water on board, how do you keep it from freezing um, if the equipment is out of service or even just in general? Shall I answer that? Oh, already? Yeah. So there are, there are several methods of dealing with this situation. Um, it should be pointed out first, the, um, the water piping system and uh, right to the nozzles is, is a dry system. So there is in normal situation, no water uh, in any of the piping. Uh, the only water is contained in a, in a cylinder. And these cylinders are designed to uh, withstand high pressures. Uh, they're not fully filled. So even if water was to freeze in them, there's enough room for the water to expand without um, bursting those cylinders. But more important, that's, that's if the system was turned out completely. In, in normal um, uh, situation, uh, if you have a freezing temperatures in low temperature countries, there are methods of, of, of heating the, the, or keeping the, uh, the water heated or above freezing. And there are also possibilities of adding a, a, an antifreeze, obviously a non-volatile, non-flammable um, antifreeze uh, to those um, to the to the um, water. But in general, uh, the cylinders can freeze uh, without uh, damage. And may just add this one point. Oh. 
specification also within yes. European uh, oper from European operators that uh, for 24 hours without power uh, it's that the system is still not freezing so means with isolation and so on some preparations of the system technical ways we also avoid within 24 hours that any freezing has happened excellent um, it looks like that's it. So thank you very much, you guys, for joining us. Um, I think it's dinner time for you, so I really appreciate it. And um, uh, if there's any more questions, I will pass them along. And an excellent presentation, and thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you as well.